All right, good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming. Uh, I'll begin with a brief introduction. Jonathan Steele, as I'm sure most of you know, is senior foreign correspondent and columnist for the uh, Guardian newspaper and author most recently of this book, Defeat, Why They Lost Iraq which I see you can purchase <laughs> very handily here on the right after the session. Uh, Jonathan had eight assignments to Iraq from just after the invasion in April of 2003 to 2007, each time spending more or less a month inside the country. In addition to the numerous interviews that he conducted in Iraq with, obviously, Iraqis, and with the officials, both British and American, civilian and military, who were involved in the evasion and occupation, he also questioned the uh, historians, the government advisors, and the politicians who prepared for, or in some cases, warned against the invasion and occupation. Now that deeply flawed occupation has been documented and explored in several excellent books in the last couple of years, and it's become more or less received wisdom that it was that very flawed occupation uh, that's the main reason America failed in its stated goal to bring democracy and security and stability to Iraq. Uh, but Jonathan argues, on the contrary, that America and its main partner, Britain, were doomed to defeat uh, long before the troop buildup even began in the Gulf in the winter of 2002. Uh, so we're going to explore that idea tonight. Um, and uh, the format will be me asking Jonathan questions for half an hour or so to begin with, and then I'll throw the floor, uh, throw questions to the floor, and you can participate and uh, a a ask Jonathan questions you've brought with you. Maybe we should begin by um, asking you to explain why. W what's the core of the argument that they were doomed to defeat before they began? Well, I think I was provoked to write this book by an increasing sense of alarm. And it wasn't alarm at what was happening in Iraq, although that was bad enough. It was alarm about what was happening here and to some extent in the United States, where the book's also coming out shortly. Uh, and that was this idea that's been gaining ground since the invasion, a kind of um, conventional wisdom, if you like, or sort of orthodox narrative that um, is now almost dominant across the field. And I thought it was both wrong and dangerous, because unless we learn the right lessons from Iraq, there's always the chance that this kind of fiasco can be repeated. And this conventional wisdom, I mean, you know the, the um, this central tenets of it. First of all, th there was no plan to go in, to, to, to run Iraq after the invasion after toppling Saddam. And secondly, that a whole lot of mistakes were made, like disbanding the Ba'ath Party, like disbanding the Iraqi National Army, like failing to stop the looting, and so on. And, and this is what's gone wrong. A series, no plan and lots of mistakes. And this is sort of encapsulated in some of the other books that have come out recently. One of them is subtitled winning the war but losing the peace. There's another book that came out about uh, two years ago by an American who had worked for the Coalition Provisional Authority, you know, the CPA, the basic, uh, the occupation, uh, called Squandered Victory. And then there was a BBC TV program, I think it was BBC quite recently, that was called simply No Plan, No Peace. Now, but when you sort of look at that argument, it's a very appealing argument, but when you look at it, it rests on the assumption that they, if the occupation had been more intelligent, more sensitive, more efficient, better managed, it could have worked. In other words, that there was a way of having a successful occupation. And this seemed to me just inherently a very implausible argument. I mean, after all, there's been a long history of Anglo-American intervention in the Middle East particularly, <coughs> treating Iraq initially by the British as a colony, and then the Americans coming in and helping to overthrow the Qassim government in 1958. And uh, obviously they've intervened in other places, Suez, Lebanon, you know, virtually every <coughs> Arab country. And it just seemed inherently implausible that Western armies could 
occupy yet again an Arab country in the 21st century when colonialism is meant to be dead and get away with it. It just seemed wrong. And of course, it's what I felt was happening uh, in the very first weeks I was there in, in Baghdad, and I think you were there too. We, we found that the, the liberation turned into occupation very quickly. Iraqis very quickly felt uh, we're now being occupied. You know, the vast majority of Iraqis were happy that Saddam had disappeared. That they were glad about. But then they was beginning to say, well, what are the Americans doing now? Why are they still here? Saddam has been toppled. There's no weapons of mass destruction. They have found that there weren't any. So what's the agenda? There must be some hidden agenda. And obviously, if you're an Arab, you think it's an imperial agenda. They must be here, not just to topple Saddam, not because there's so-called weapons of mass destruction, but for something else. Oil, obviously, control of our country, use us as a base against Iran, against Syria, whatever it is, there's some other agenda, which is not our agenda. And so that's where the suspicion began. It appears that the American government, uh, things went badly awry almost immediately. But if you look at how Jay Garner was parachuted in there, I think that his original mandate for, was for 90 days in and out. Uh, and, and that the American government thought it could go in, lightly occupy, and then vanish again. Um, what went wrong there? What does your investigation show happened to turn it into a long-lived and, and, and very bloody occupation that has patently failed? Well, uh, some people who've read this book <coughs> seem to think that I've been arguing that the invasion was okay, the occupation is the mistake. Um, and that is not actually what I'm arguing. I mean, I accept that the invasion was illegal, that it was unnecessary because the weapons inspectors were in there. If, if that's what the aim was and it was the stated aim, uh, you should have given the inspectors more time. But I also thought it wouldn't work in advance. But I concentrate on the book, not on the invasion, but on the occupation, perhaps simply because I make so much of, a, of my emphasis goes on the occupation. Some people think that uh, I sort of supported the invasion. <coughs> but I do say that, that the, the Americans could have withdrawn with some dignity um, if they had announced almost immediately after the, the toppling of the regime that they were leaving by the end of the year, let's say, or within six months or something, a relatively short period, in which time it would be up to the Iraqis to choose their own new post-Saddam government. And if there was any security issues after that, then the UN peacekeepers could come in with a, with a proper mandate uh, at the request of the Iraqi government, um, the newly chosen Iraqi government. And I think in a funny way, as you mentioned uh, about Ghana, I think some people in the Pentagon, Jay Ghana was one, and even Donald Rumsfeld, he gets, you know, he's, it's easy to pillory Donald Rumsfeld, <laughs> and he's a pretty ghastly figure. but. On, on, it's in some instinctive way, he's, he's not really a neocon. He, he is more a realist <coughs> school of American foreign policy. He sort of understood that this had to be uh, a relatively short occupation. And Tommy Franks, the head of US Central Command, was telling his people, we're going to have to be down to 30,000 troops by August 2003. Jay Garner went in there as the sort of top American, I mean, he is a general, but he was meant to be in charge of the civilian thing, this office of. Uh, reconstruction Humanitarian Assistance, OHA, and he was telling his wife, I'll be home by August. Um, so that was the idea. They felt it would be quick in and out because we do our job, and they, there's even some quotes that you can find from them saying that sort of instinctively Iraqis won't want an occupation and we have to be aware of that. But the problem it was that the neocons in the Bush administration <coughs> overcame the realists. And the neocons always wanted an occupation. Their idea was long-term US presence in Iraq for various reasons. One was the oil I mentioned. One was to have a bastion, uh, a military bastion in the region to put pressure on Iran and Syria. Then you know, the more sort of visionary neocons had this idea that they could turn Iraq into a, a secular, pro-Western, liberal state in, in, in the Middle East, you know, something perhaps a bit like Turkey, except it would be Arab. Um, and uh, you know, uh, Americans would be there a long time to make sure this worked out properly. <coughs> You've mentioned that uh, 
ultimately there was this burning resentment I across the Middle East, but especially in Iraq, against occupations and, far and, and, and the idea of foreigners arriving and, and cloaking the, the mission um, as, as, uh, as something that would be good for Iraqis, but in essence it was all self-interest. Can you talk a little bit about some of the aspects of the occupation that played in the most terrible way to exacerbate that resentment and those fears and the conspiracy theory of many Iraqis that the Americans had come to steal their country? Well, one of the first instances was in Fallujah. Three weeks after Saddam's <coughs> statue was toppled in Baghdad, the um, 82nd Airborne Division moved into Fallujah. Now, there were the city was liberated already without the presence of the Americans. The local mayor, who a Baathist obviously had fled, he'd been replaced by a new man chosen by the local imams and the tribal sheikhs. <coughs> the police were beginning to come back into operation, and uh, <coughs> the town was just you know trying to start a new life, as it were. <coughs> Suddenly, the 82nd Airborne Division arrives there. There's no need to come. There was no resistance. There was no insurgency. There was no Al-Qaeda. Why did they have to go in there in the first place? They started putting up checkpoints, roadblocks, checking people's ID. They put up a, right next to the mayor's office. They put up a sort of command post with razor wire and sandbagged gun emplacements on the roof and so on. And they took over a local school quite near the city center. <coughs> And on the, roughly the third day that they were there, there was a demonstration, and people marched to the school saying, you know, we want the Americans to vacate it. I mean, it wasn't just that they wanted the school opened, although that was a, an important point. The schools had all been closed, obviously, during the bombing campaign. It was now time to get back to normal. People wanted the school back. But there was also, uh, uh, as we heard from Iraqis, I'm sure you must have heard the similar things, The um, the school was right opposite a residential street, middle-class sort of houses. And people ha didn't like the, the, the uh, Americans on the roof with their night vision goggles, you know, looking at all the houses. You know, there was first, you know, there was a perception that they can not only look through the curtains, but they may be even be able to look through people's clothes. You know, there were literally people were saying, this is what they're doing. It's disgusting, you know, it's pornographic. What are they doing with these goggles? Um, so there was that feeling. The, you've got these outsiders with this strange equipment, unnecessary, and they're occupying the school. Um, and so there was a demonstration. Uh, now, something went wrong. It's not quite clear what happened, but the Americans shot 13 people dead, and others died later of their wounds. <coughs> and <coughs> we went down the next day. I went down with colleagues from Baghdad, and we'd heard that there'd been this incident. <coughs> it's really the first big incident where you know a substantial number of people have been killed for apparent, no apparent reason. Um, and we talked to the commanders and they said uh, uh, people fired at us, of course we had to return fire. The uh, Iraqis said uh, it's nonsense, the Americans just opened fire for no reason. Now it, it was hard to tell who was telling the truth, but the, the, the visual evidence seemed to support the Iraqi side. There was no sign of any bullet holes that we could see anyway, and a number of reporters there, we all were trying to do the same thing, to spot the, the bullet holes in this, on the school where the Americans were, and there, there weren't any. <coughs> Whereas obviously the houses opposite were completely you know, gashed and pockmarked with, with, with weapon, you know, from heavy weapons holes and, and concrete smashed away and bits fallen off and so on, and sometimes holes right through the wall. Um, and uh, it was clear that the Americans had done a massive amount of firing, and the Iraqis might have done some, but it must have sort of gone over the building, or they couldn't have hit the building, because we saw no evidence of that. Um, and so there was tremendous anger, and um, I think, in a way, that was a spark that lit the insurgency, because here you had a proud Islamic Sunni city, which feels it's been invaded for no reason, then finds it's the occupiers misbehaving, 13 people are dead, it's a revenge culture where people you know, want to take revenge for the, their dead brothers or fathers or husbands or whatever it is. And um, you know, that was the first episode. And then, of course, it was repeated many, many times. I mean, in the first two years 
of the occupation <coughs> until uh, March 2005, the Americans killed 2,654 civilians. <coughs> now, we tend to think that the major killing of Iraqis is done by suicide bombers or car bomb attacks. But, you know, you've got to rewind history and go back to the beginning, and it's the beginning that sets the trend of everything. In the number of people killed by suicide car bombings and, uh, and other suicide attacks was a quarter of the number that I've given you, 2,654 in the first two years of the occupation. The Americans were killing far more people than the Iraqi insurgents, resistance, whatever you want to call it. But the, I mean, it's partly the fault of the, the media, I think, because um, you know, these car bomb attacks and the suicide things happened initially largely in Baghdad, where we all were based. So we would rush out, the camera people would rush out, TV would rush out, <coughs> take pictures of this. And, and so the image comes to the view of the reader in the West that, that this is the most <coughs> ghastly thing that's happening, these, all these terrible suicide bombs, where the, the American counterinsurgency, so-called operations in smaller towns and villages in Anbar province and, and, and in uh, the, the other Sunni provinces, was not visible so easily to, to reporters. And so, you know, this, the, the facts on the ground, which for the Americans were killing four times as many people as the insurgents, got distorted and reversed in the public mind. The, <coughs> the whole thing was exacerbated terribly by the lack of communication between Americans and Iraqis, and especially the lack of interpreters available to help the military communicate with the people. Can you talk a little bit about that and how deadly it became? Well, that was true. There were, there were no interpreters at the beginning, and then they began to hire a few. But that was, I mean, the, the linguistic sort of barrier was only one of the barriers. I mean, there was the cultural barrier, the, the political barrier, the psychological barrier, and everything. I mean, I was just, um, we were just having a talk downstairs before I came up, and I was talking about how um, <clears throat> another event that happened in Fallujah that was almost a sort of iconic, that it showed the different perception from how Arabs saw it and how <coughs> local Iraqis saw it and how the West saw it was the the episode when four contractors, um, I mean, we call them contractors, but you can call them mercenaries, you know, they were armed people, Blackwater, uh, the armed mercenaries, um, who were, whose car was stopped in Fallujah, well, SUVs were stopped, and then um, they were dragged from the car, and uh, the car was shot and forced to stop, and then they were dragged from the car. and finished off those that weren't already dead, and then their bodies, two of them at least, were mutilated and hung from the bridge over the Euphrates in Fallujah. Big, you know, probably most people here would remember that incident. It caused a huge sort of storm in America particularly, obviously, because these people were American. Um, <clears throat> and it seemed some kind of bestial, totally unprovoked, disgusting uh, episode. But actually, I'd been down to Fallujah in the just two or three days before that happened, because we'd had reports that the Marines, who were by then based there, had um, been going in, doing sort of incursions for a few hours, usually at night, and then staying till early morning <coughs> into Fallujah to deal, they said, with, uh, with uh, insurgents or resistance. Um, but it was very similar to the incident that I mentioned at the school, but sort of writ large and spread over four days. They came, there were helicopters firing rockets that were going through people's houses, killing people indiscriminately. They put marine snipers on the roofs of, uh, of buildings and people who came out into the street and were considered in some way suspicious, which were shot. Um, and uh, people showed us around, you know, they, we, as Western reporters in those days, you could go to these scenes and not be, uh, no, hint of being kidnapped or anything of that kind. They were, uh, you know, like, the, like people in Gaza. Uh, you know, they want you to see what's happened because they feel the thing is so one-sided. Um, and they were, uh, one particular family, I remember, uh, were really uh, furious because the father had come out at 2 a.m. hearing some sort of peculiar noise in the street and, uh, and was then shot because the Marines 
you know, thought he was coming out to shoot at them, I suppose. Uh, what's he doing in the street at night? But I mean, he legitimately thought, what, well, there's noise in the street at night, you know, and he came out of his house to have a look. Um, <coughs> so there was, there was a funeral, uh, and the whole family went to the mosque <coughs> to, 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 to bury the father. And while they were there, they were told by some neighbors, you know, don't go home at the end of the service because the Americans have taken over your house. You know, watch it. So they had then had to spend the, n the next night in the uh, in some friends' houses and relatives, and then they got word the next morning about seven o'clock that the Americans had pulled out again. So they went back to the house, and, and I was there, and they showed me around, and we we walked around, and it, 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 was, it was just a scene of complete destruction. What had happened was that the Americans had house was on the corner of the street and therefore in a good strategic position. It was also rather taller than the other houses, had an extra floor, and so it was a good position to, to, to have a vantage point. But the Americans had gone in there, they obviously slept there, they uh, these um, <coughs> plastic uh, containers in which you have the, your meals, your ready, meals ready to eat, MREs, just been thrown around all over the place, cupboards had been pulled down, sofas that had sort of bayonets pushed through to check you know whether there were weapons or anything hidden in the upholstery um, they claimed to us that money had been stolen I mean I couldn't verify whether that was the case or not but they were really upset that the the teenage daughter's bedroom had also uh, been uh, ransacked and all the little drawers where the <coughs> girls had had their jewelry and stuff had been pulled out and there were MREs on the floor and so they assumed you know these the people that you know these people have been sleeping and lying on our teenage daughters sisters uh, beds you know, you know they, that really was a cultural no-no and the people were just furious and and this all played into the the kind of fury that that foreigners were there at all and and just wouldn't leave and wouldn't say when they were leaving that's right i mean i think the, the crucial thing was there was the occupation is open-ended, still is. There's still no terminal date for when it's going to be over. And, and so this, this idea that there's a hidden agenda and they're just staying here for their own purposes it, it becomes more and more embedded in people's minds. And so, uh, as I said, even at the, the first opinion polls done after the invasion showed that the majority of people already thought it was an occupation, not a liberation. But the, the numbers who felt that shot up so it, it, it from being sort of 54 44 kind of thing it, it went up to about 80 uh, uh, 20 uh, <coughs> and a very small minority thought they really had been liberated can you talk a little bit about Jerry Bremer who succeeded Jay Garner Jay Garner was the first uh, guy he, he probably ends up being a little bit of a victim of, of shifting policy and the shifting uh, politics of Washington um, and then came uh, Jerry Bremer, who was the, the viceroy, if you like. Uh, many people uh, re remember him. He got a lot of uh, ink, and he got a lot of time on television, and he ended up being widely loathed, uh, I think. Perhaps you can talk a little bit about your impressions of him and also how he made it worse. Well, he, he was obviously a neocon, and, and he had the completely the wrong template. As I say, uh, you know, this occupation was doomed from the start, but Bremer... You know, almost by definition, occupations are going to be unpopular. What people want to see foreign troops in their street, foreign tanks going down the road. So, so you have to start with the premise that occupations are inherently unpopular, and it's only exceptionally that they work. And the two exceptions in modern times where they worked have been Germany after 1945 and Japan after 1945. <clears throat> and of course, they're completely specific reasons why there was no resistance by the Germans to the American occupation or by the Japanese. In the Japanese <coughs> case, it's clear. Uh, uh, the, the, the Douglas MacArthur had the sense to keep the emperor there as a symbol of continuity. So the regime wasn't toppled as such. The emperor remained, and he called on people to accept uh, the surrender and to be obedient to the new rulers. And, and the Japanese accepted that, and so there was no armed resistance. Germany it was a different case, of course, but the same reason why should there be resistance? Because uh, people were just completely on their knees after six years of war and complete hunger and devastation. The country had been bombed to smithereens, and uh, 
it's also the Cold War, and so people in the West were worried about the East and so on, so they weren't going to ask the Americans to leave. Um, so those were very specific cases, but, but Bremer, even in his book called My Year in Iraq, which he wrote a year after there, after he came back, so it's two years after he'd gone there, so he would have had thought, had some time to reflect, uh, said in his book, <coughs> our aim <coughs> was to ensure that like Germany and Japan, we created a success story that would last 50 years. So he had completely the wrong template to start with. Uh, he was also a neocon who had this idea of bringing democracy by force. And he, he was an extremely arrogant man, as, as I'm sure you would have seen. Arrogant, rude. I mean, he, 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 his memoirs are really astonishingly enlightening. I mean, he talks so rudely about the Iraqis. They can't get the act, act together. They can never take decisions. When they do, they reverse them the next day. I mean, completely um, contemptuous uh, of the Iraqis, who he was allegedly there in order to hand power to. Um, and I remember particularly one comment he made, which is uh, on the same line of not understanding the psychology and getting the template wrong. He, his father was a businessman and lived in France uh, soon after the war. And, and, and Bremer, as a teenager, spent some time in, in Paris. And he, I remember once in a sort of semi-off-the-record briefing we were having, he s somebody asked about um, <coughs> you know uh, uh, the liberation and, and 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 it's gone wrong, hasn't it? And you're not getting much gratitude. And he said, "Oh well, yes, I remember being in Paris uh, 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 when I was a young man, and so on. The French have never forgiven us for liberating them." <laughs> I I can remember. Perhaps uh, were you there when uh, things were really going? haywire uh, fast and the the uh, the bombings were increasing and there was a lot of popular <coughs> resentment and the it, it, the insurrection was beginning to attract all kinds of different disaffected people who previously hadn't been active and he was busy trying to establish a tax-free business zone do you remember that mm. and it was mm. one of those height of absurdity moments real through the looking glass stuff. and then he was trying to get rid of the food rationing system i mean you know, 60% of Iraqis were dependent on the food ration. <coughs> there were warehouses uh, in every uh, suburb where and people were registered, and it was all done very efficiently with computerized lists and so on, and according to the number of kids you had and how many people in your family. Uh, it wasn't done on a, a, a sort of means-tested thing. Everybody got it automatically. But 60% of the people actually used it because they relied on it. Um, you could get you know, your rice free, uh, cheaper, and your cooking oil, and sugar, and flour, and stuff. And, and it was obviously you know, terribly needed, particularly in the post-war situation. And Bremer came in and said, oh, government subsidies, food rations? This is impossible. It's a free market. You know, why can't people buy the stuff? You know, and if the more money goes into the system, it'll get stronger, and there'll be more to buy. You know, I mean, it's kind of extraordinary thing. Now his fatal decisions, and I think that they're widely accepted to have been fatal decisions of, of, of saying senior Baathists could no longer serve in the government and, uh, and disbanding the army, um, really played into the whole, or maybe even were, was essential fuel to the fire that, mm. that was lit mm. against the Americans, mm. wasn't it? Yes, no, I mean these things were terrible mistakes. I mean I remember in the Shia area, and we were talking mainly about Sunni up to now, but the Shia area, <coughs> there was also massive disaffection with the, with the occupation, mainly with the British, of course, because they were the ones down here, down there. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the pre-war assumption by the invaders had been that the Shia would be definitely on side because uh, they've always been suppressed by the Sunnis and uh, they rose up after um, <coughs> 1991 and uh, then they weren't liberated then and they're very disappointed and now we'll sort of finish the job and they'll be uh, delighted. But there was one episode where, where <coughs> uh, we were just driving down the road and suddenly I saw this crowd of people outside a bank and they were <coughs> just sort of milling around trying to get in. There were these young British squaddies who were sort of attempting to keep order in some sort of way. <coughs> and we stopped and started asking what's going on in here and so on. And we realized that <coughs> these were people who were, they were former members of the army who had been told they were entitled to an emergency handout. I think it was about $40. <coughs> <coughs> 
um, to uh, you know to sort of compensation or make up for the salaries or whatever it was. This was some mm -hmm. some. This was July 2003, so it was about six weeks after they had abolished the army, but there was already a massive disaffection, and he thought, well, maybe I can sort of calm it down by, you know, allowing for this special payment to people. So here were these people. Um, first of all, the, you know, the officers didn't want to queue with the men. Now, that's fair the, the assumption, you know, that could be made in any country. You know, officers don't like to queue with men, so the, the British were trying to sort of, soldiers were trying to sort of separate the officers on one side and the men. I mean, that, and that was quite quickly done. But then, you know, the, it takes time to go into the bank. Only they only allowed 12 people at a time, and um, it was very, very hot too. It was July, and um, these men were getting increasingly angry. They were saying, you know, we, we we talked to them through an interpreter. They were saying, look, we're being shouted at by these young men in a foreign language. We're having to queue in the hot sunshine for an unlimited amount of time to get forty dollars handout from foreign occupiers. You know, everything was wrong. <laughs> mm. Quite a lot's been written about the blindness of the neocons or the ideological blinders that they had. But you uh, say remarkably in Britain, which we, we, we uh, at least I assume would be more, in, if not enlightened, at least more open-minded and certainly with a much more connected sense of history in the Middle East, there was equal if not blindness, at least an unwillingness to get properly informed. Um, ministers weren't properly briefed on the complexities of trying to occupy this country, uh, and even Tony Blair didn't seem to want to hear the message. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I mean, I, there was one meeting only that uh, Blair had where he invited outsiders to come in and brief him. Western outsiders. He had quite a lot of meetings with Iraqi exiles, who, uh, but only the group that were pro-invasion. Um, they're obviously outsiders, uh, outside the Whitehall machine, I mean. Um, but he, the, the only time when he got sort of Western British outsiders to come in was when he invited six academics in November 2002 to come in. Three of them were Iraq specialists, and three of them were people who were experts on international security and the regional issues of the Middle East and so on. And uh, they agreed among themselves they wouldn't sort of get t directly into the question of whether the invasion should happen or not, because they thought that would just alienate Blair and he wouldn't listen. Um, so they, they sort of <coughs> indirectly <laughs> made their points by saying this is a very complicated thing. You know, this is a country you know, <coughs> with, with sectarian and ethnic tensions. Uh, there's probably going to be resistance, uh, armed resistance, and um, it's a very fractured country, and it's going to be quite difficult to, to, to see how it can be occupied successfully. And at the end of the spiel that one of them gave, um, Blair just looked up and said, but he is uniquely evil, isn't he? This chap was completely flummoxed. It seemed to be so off the point. Uh, he he's then sort of repeated some of his points and said, but, but Blair said, but, but he can choose, can't he? He can choose, presumably, between good and evil. I mean, it wasn't quite clear what he was meant to be choosing. <laughs> but, uh, but I think almost more alarming than that, um, I mean, they came away. Uh, uh, Jack Straw was there also, by the way. Jack Straw had really set this thing up. And I think he. May have sort of hoped to bring a little bit of realism on, into Blair by inviting these people, and they said, you know, Straw they found asked uh, good questions and seemed to be engaged on the issue and really followed up what they were saying, and not these comments of the kind that Blair made. And uh, they they came away feeling that sort of Blair's uh, analysis of politics is simply what is the personality of the top chap on the other side. He didn't seem to be interested in his history, didn't seem to be interested in political trends, social context, or anything. Um, but I think more, almost more alarming, as alarming as that, was this: what I found when I talked to former Foreign Office people. Because if you remember, about a year after the invasion, there was an open letter written by 52 former British ambassadors and Foreign Office officials and diplomats. 
most of whom who'd served in the region, the sort of Arabists. And they denounced the occupation and said, uh, everybody predicted, all the experts predicted that it would go wrong. Um, so I, when I started researching this book, thought, well, I'll, I'll I'll try and talk to the, 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 the newer generation of Arabists, the people who were in the Foreign Office at the time in 2002 and 2003 and who now retired uh, and who might be willing to talk to me in a more you know, open, direct way um, now that they're no longer in the Foreign Office. <clears throat> and I assumed that I would hear the same sort of stuff from them as, as we, uh, that was in the open letter. And to my sort of astonishment, uh, I began to get the message that this wasn't the case. I mean, they were very honest. Uh, you know, they could have you know, pretended that they'd seen it all coming, but they were quite honest. They were saying, you know, we didn't, we didn't foresee this. Um, and uh, one of them said to me, you know, the, the view in the office was that uh, Iraq was one of the most um, <coughs> uh, sophisticated Arab countries with a, with a sort of largely English-speaking elite, a secular, professional, Western-oriented, and so on, and that therefore these people were the ones who would come to the top once Saddam was toppled. And uh, another ambassador I spoke to was, who was really quite close to the whole issue of um, the Shia Islamists <coughs> uh, said to me, you know, we'd, we'd never heard of Muqtada al-Sadr, we didn't quite know what Sistani's line was, um, you know, in other words, he, he, they didn't know what the Shia position would be. Um, and um, they, they said that, uh, that you know, as far as they were aware, no position papers had gone up to the Foreign Secretary to um, really le said what are the political consequences in Iraq of invading and toppling? Who will come out on top? What, what are the scenarios? What are the options that we're likely to have to deal with? Just, they just didn't get it. I mean, the, you know, there are various reasons why that might have happened. Uh, some, some of these diplomats said, well, you know, the whole focus was on the United Nations. We were trying to get a second resolution. Uh, and uh, that was the sort of, really, the, the emphasis of the Foreign Office was to do that. Other people have complained that there's been a trend over the last few years to cut the Foreign Office budget. And that has meant that a lot of the policy planning has gone out of the window, and it's all crisis management now, and dealing with um, you know the issues of the moment rather than thinking ahead. Um, others have said, uh, perhaps more damagingly, in terms of the image of the Foreign Office, that <coughs> this new culture has come in of being much more subservient to ministers, sort of giving them what they want to hear, not raising difficulties, not creating problems by bringing up um, things that might go against what they feel is the already a intended line of government policy. Um, and had some of them not also either been told to believe or else begun to accept the fantasy that this c cadre of exiles that the Americans had cultivated were just going to be injected in <laughs> Take yes, over, I think run I think I think, I think they had they were quite good on the on the on the sort of western the exiles living in the west um, all the Chalabis and the Ayatollahis all those sort of people they had very good contacts with them regular meetings but those people were all such or, or or they were worse than that they were telling lies like Chalabi seems to have been doing about what was going to happen um, but you some sort of basic paradox about this whole thing that should have been ringing a red you know alarm bell. Um, which was, which countries had no embassies in Baghdad after 1991? Britain and America. Which countries had embassies? Germany, France, Russia. Now how come, <laughs> or isn't it obvious that the Germans, the French, the Russians could see what was going to happen with an invasion? <laughs> the British and the Americans didn't because there was no for 12 years, we'd had nobody on the ground in Baghdad, so there was no core of diplomats in the Foreign Office who had direct experience of having served in Baghdad. The, the ones who had served there, a lot of them had already retired, and you know they were the Arabists that we were talking about who later wrote the letter. Um, so that, it, 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 you know, and there was 
one has to presume no MI6 uh, operation going on in, in, in Iraq between 1991 and 2003. I mean, it's very hard to have human intelligence uh, you know, sort of agents on the ground because the Saddam regime was so repressive. So you had to rely on the open diplomacy. Um, and we didn't have diplomats. So the paradox is that the two countries that were most keen on having an invasion were the two countries that had least information about Iraq. I'm going to throw, uh, throw questions to the floor in a moment, but one last one. I have been struck. I'm very touched off in, in all the, the times I was in Iraq after the invasion at how savvy the soldiers were, and particularly many American officers who are also very good historians and strategists with you know, great academics as well as being military officers. And many of them knew that they were being set up for defeat. Uh, they felt angry and they felt um, uh, as if their military integrity was going to be compromised by the mission. Um, how, how did you see the role of the military, and I'm particularly interested in the British military, and how savvy were they to the whole, the poison chalice of it all, if you like? Well, I, I mean, I, one of the senior officers, <coughs> people who was in charge at the time, <coughs> said to me last year, <laughs> on a completely you know, non attributable basis, he said, you know, this is a family quarrel, <coughs> and one doesn't intervene in family quarrels if you're an outsider. Um, and that really was, I think, the mindset. But, you know, they did their duty. They did what they were supposed to do. Um, some of them could have resigned, but they didn't. Um, but they, 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 I think they fairly soon, I mean, they were never neocons, of course, the British military. So that this idea of sort of bringing democracy, I don't think they believed in. What they wanted was stability <coughs> and uh, containment. They wanted to contain any kind of problems so that reconstruction could begin. And to have containment, you have to have stability. And so you don't try and sort of foist on people uh, the kind of rulers that you think they ought to have, all this, these secular liberal people who've been in exile all the time. Um, you just sort of come in and you m more pragmatically sort of say, well, who's in charge? Who are the strong ones here? And let's you know, talk to them and deal with get them on board and, and try and have as broad a base spectrum as possible, but you know, not let, don't kid ourselves that we can tell them who's running the show. And this was actually very disappointing to, uh, to, 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 to the secular liberals. Not, not, I don't mean the secular liberals who'd been in exile, but the secular liberals who'd remained in, 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 in Basra, we're now talking about. Um, the British appointed two or three different governors, and then there were various reasons. There were protests from local people saying, this chap's a Ba'athist, you know, how could you appoint a Ba'athist? Or this chap's from this tribe, and they're well known to be, you know, cutthroats or something, whatever it was. You know, all kinds of reasons were given why somebody couldn't be the governor, and the British, to their credit, then dumped that person and chose another one. And then finally, um, about six months before that first election, January 2005, they put, a, put an Islamist in charge. And uh, this was very disappointing. I remember in the run-up to the January 2005 elections when I talked to these people, you know, the sort of the Guardian reading <laughs> public of Basra, if you like, you know, the doctors, the lawyers, the architects, the engineers, many of them indeed English-speaking. Uh, virtually every doctor you ever meet in Iraq speaks English because the medical schools train in English. It's the language of instruction. Um, and all these people saying, oh, why are the British, why have they put this Islamist in as governor? It's terrible. Sends all the wrong signals. And you know, I said, well, you know, that's just the way they operate. You know, they look and see where, who's strongest. And they, you know, there'll be less, least resistance, least problem if they you know, put the, one of the strongest people in. And of course, then when the election happened, uh, the uh, the Islamists won. There were three different Islamist groups, and you know, they coalesced, and they, they won massively. <coughs> You're ready to take some questions from the audience. We have a microphone here. If you put up your hands, I'll, I'll call on you, and then uh, you can have the microphone and ask a question. We'll just begin right here. Right. Uh, as someone, not a journalist at all, somebody who works on the ground and lives in central and southern Iraq over about two or three years, um, I think that, that it, it, there's a very political view which you've given, but I think there's another view, and I don't disagree with, with, with a lot of it, 
think there's another point as well, and that is before the intervention, and I'll call it that, not the occupation of Vietnam, but before the intervention, um, the standard of living was going down seriously amongst the average Iraqi. And there are many reasons for that, but one, one, one was the degrading the infrastructure which has been going on for years and years and years, and it, was, it actually collapsed almost coincidentally at the time the British were there in the summer of 2003. And it really comes down to, I think, as much about the livelihoods and the standard of living that people have, the basic needs. If you look in societies all around the world, that's what the average person that actually care who's leading particularly. They, they really want to, to be able to just get on their lives in a basic way. That, that's the very bottom of the Maslow triangle that they need to, to, to satisfy. And I think that journalists, and not just journalists, but get carried away with the politics of society and forget all this side. And one of the reasons I think that happens is that it was very noticeable how few Germans actually got out into the real Iraq. Uh, they're always reporting from Baghdad, hotel tops in Baghdad or, uh, or wherever. And even down to Badr, a lot of journalists only just flew down courtesy of the RAF and then back again. And, and it, one of the reasons, of course, was the hostile nature of the country. Um, but but the real, the real, what the real situation was going on amongst the real people wasn't reported hardly at all, and very sad to see that the other side of the story has not been reported. Um, and I think, and, and all I think is the truth in what you say, I think there's also, um, what if, without the intervention, Iraq would probably have uh, got into to self-destruct anyway, because the people have rebelled again. Yeah, ultimately, their, 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 their whole basic of living is taken away from them, it was going that way. They, they, they wouldn't have been able to carry on as they were. And so that would have fallen through like some other way. Can I deal with that? Or yes, please yeah. do. Okay, no, well, uh, first of all, I mean, there are passages in my book where I deal with some of the points you've raised, and I think I said at one point that, well, first of all, as I've said already, that the majority of Iraqis certainly welcomed the departure of Saddam. <coughs> Secondly, I think I say the occupation would have been tolerated in the sense that there wouldn't have been resistance if it had been short and sweet. And by sweet, I mean exactly the kind of things you're talking about. Had the the occupation f forces, authority, very quickly, you know, got the thing going again, the power, the water, and, and, and all that. Uh, people would have said, okay, you know, something's changed, it's getting better, because what you say is quite correct about the infrastructure being worn down. But, and sometimes, uh, again, I would give you, uh, concede to you that there, sometimes Iraqis had unrealistic expectations, you know, that you'd, you'd hear people saying, um, you know, they toppled uh, the Saddam in, in three weeks. Why can't they get the sort of electricity going? It was a constant complaint. Uh, you know, obviously, as you say, you know, you can't sort of suddenly build a new power station in <coughs> three weeks or three months and, and, and get the grid working properly. So there were problems. But you'd also hear, and this was, I mean, I wasn't there in 1991, so I don't know whether it's true, but, but we all heard it, and I don't think any of my colleagues really contested it. We, we heard them saying, you know, Saddam managed to get the electricity going properly in three months after the uh, invasion, and, uh, you know, after the defeat in 1991. Why can't this, these people, you know, Britain and America, get it going in the same amount of time? The, the, so they made a comparison with what had happened before, which was a negative as far as the coalition was concerned. Uh, but I must uh, seriously contest your line about journalists didn't get out. I mean, in the first year, uh, until about autumn 2004, so almost the first 18 months, we could travel around all over the place, and we did. We drove everywhere. I went to Basra by car all the time, didn't go by plane, um, and stopped in Kut and Amara and all these other places, and Nasiriya, and talked to people, stayed in hotels, there was no fear of kidnapping, there was no hostility because I was British or anything. Um, I'm sure, you know, American... Canadian reporters had the same experience. So, so this idea that we were just sitting in no, kind of safe houses is nonsense. But after that, it's really, it's yes, but, uh, but, I, but the whole point is that this occupation went sour very, very early on. Uh, it's become much more complex now. I, I give you that. You know, now there's the sectarian struggles going on and battles and, uh, and so on, which you can't, uh, you know, in the broad brush way, you can say the occupation by sort of throwing all the cards in the air is responsible partly for the sectarian clashes, but you know, more immediately, it, you can't blame it for that. So it has gone bad, uh, and, and, and the, you can't blame the coalition for everything. But I mean, the first 18 months, which were crucial in setting the pattern and creating the mood uh, and creating the anger and creating the resistance, 
um, the armed resistance, I mean, uh, it was done in the beginning when we as journalists could travel and we talked to people. That's, uh, that's how we know that. We, we heard them saying, we, you know, I've got endless quotes in there from people saying, you know, we want the Americans to leave now. Why are they staying so long? And I'm going to start to, I mean, one of the people in the, in the, um, in this queue that I mentioned, queuing up to get the $40 handout, actually said to me, look, if this goes much longer, I'm going to join in Al-Qaeda. Um, I mean, he said that to me. I took, I took his name. You know, he, he wasn't frightened to be reported to saying that. So one way he recognized that it was a freer situation. On the other hand, he was so angry, he was willing to, you know, go to armed resistance. Next. Yes, madam. Hi, Catherine Orson. Um, Iraq, five years hence, what does it look like in your view? What's the, what's the political situation? Can you describe it? Well, the political situation is, is disastrous. I mean, there's a, there's a government which is uh, Shia-dominated, Islamist, and very narrow-minded from a sectarian point of view. It's not willing to make any concessions to the Sunnis. And the Americans are trying to push pressure on it, uh, but not succeeding. Um, it, so, so, you know, that's the main political problem. The, 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 they talk about political reconciliation, but they don't take any steps to implement it. And, and so you've got a, a, a very, very weak and, uh, and narrow-minded government. And that would be the same five years from now? Well, my uh, argument in there is, th is that the, 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 the follows logically from everything I've been saying. If is, 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 is the occupation is doomed, then let's admit it. Let's admit defeat and, and prepare to withdraw. <coughs> you can't get 150,000 American troops out in three minutes or three weeks, three months. It's going to take at least six to nine months. But there has to be an announcement that it's happening. So everybody knows this is now the end game. They're going. They're not going to be permanent. They're going. So in the meantime, <coughs> You don't just sort of sit there and do nothing. You start, the, the, the politics change dramatically overnight because the Americans are the elephant in the room. They distort everything. Some people are fighting them, some people are blaming them, some people are hiding behind them, some people are being, relying on them. But whatever it is, they are always the factor. Uh, and, uh, and once people know that that is coming to an end, then they, uh, the equation changes <coughs> and people will have to say, no, no, what happens now? What kind of country? It's our country now. We won't have any occupation. What's going to happen? Now, it, 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 one possible uh, hope, and you know, uh, I can't predict the future any bit more than anybody else can, uh, and I can be as wrong as anybody else can be, but one hope is that the Al-Qaeda people will, their support will fade away, because they're foreigners as much as the Americans are, and, and most Iraqis don't like what Al-Qaeda is doing. So Al-Qaeda will be, you know, whatever rationale it's got for being there, i.e. to fight the Americans, will disappear when the Americans are leaving. Um, so it will make it easier for the movement that is already operating, this awakening movement of, turning, of Iraqi nationalists turning against Al-Qaeda. That will be strengthened. So hopefully Al-Qaeda will be diminished and, you know, reduced. I can't and imagine it will just disappear totally. Uh, it, during the period that the Americans start withdrawing and everybody knows that, that they mean it and it's not just a trick. Um, secondly, this political breakdown of dialogue between the Sunnis and the Shia may be reversible and, and, and the Shia may start saying, well, we have to live with the Sunnis. Because the, 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 there is an idea that, you know, Iraq's doomed to break up. <coughs> that it'll split into three, Kurds, Sunni, Shia. That's very simplistic uh, because the Shia community is divided on that. The Sadrists, who are the strongest, uh, probably, armed militia, are, are in favor of a unitary, um, united Iraq. They're not in favor of this, this system of autonomous regions, let alone a breakup. Um, and so there is a point of convergence there with the Sunnis, who certainly don't want Iraq to break up. They don't have any oil on their territory, so they certainly don't want to be left in some kind of rump Sunni area. So there is a potential for convergence, although coming back to the sectarian killings of the last year and a half, there's been so much killing between Sunnis and Shias, so much suspicion now among Sunnis of Muqtada al-Sadr because of his malicious behavior, uh, even though he himself keeps denouncing these sectarian killings 
it's happening and his people have been involved and so there's a lot of bad blood and revenge seeking going on. Um, so it, it'll be very hard to bridge that gap but, but hopefully it, it can be bridged and I think there, there should be some national conference which will be convened not by the Americans but by the UN or the Arab League which will be much wider than this government and the people who sit in parliament who have a very narrow base that would include religious leaders, civil society leaders, trade unions, women's groups, uh, and so on, you know, to, a, a sort of compact for a new Iraq where people would come, you know, with the same sort of thing happening at the provincial level where, where you try and get a unit, unified administrations in all the provincial cities as well as in Baghdad. I mean, one of the things that is about to happen if the Americans have their way are provincial elections. Well, I think that's... Um, a recipe for disaster at this stage because under the winner-take-all system that only adds to the competition which already there is uh, it's much better to try and push for, for coalitions and unity and say you know in a wartime situation or an immediate post-war situation you can't have you know winner-take-all elections you've got to sort of concentrate on unity reconstruction <coughs> reconciliation compromise dialogue and so on and not competition um, so there are all kinds of things that can be done at the political level in the six to nine months it'll take for the Americans to go, but the sine qua known of anything has to be a clear, unambiguous, sincere, provable, transparent decision by the Americans to set an early date for withdrawal. Go ahead. Hi, gentlemen. My name is Elvis Caldwell. And George, uh, George Bush Senior, with the aid of the collision forces, did not go into Baghdad for the very reasons that you stated earlier on that George Bush Jr. failed. Why do you think George Bush Jr. went into Baghdad despite the fact that he had the same neocons as one of his father's administration? No, his father didn't have neocons. His father had realists. But um, he had Cheney, he had Rumsfeld. Yeah, but Cheney, I think, is, is actually a hard-nosed realist. Uh, people like Brent Scowcroft were there, who certainly is a realist and who also is... You know, he wasn't part of the junior Bush administration and has, has criticized the invasion. No, no, I think the George Bush senior administration was pretty much a realist, uh, hard-nosed realist, not this missionary kind of neocon stuff. Can I, can I add a, uh, uh, a secondary question? Um, how, how much do you think the actual invasion had to do with America still being angry after 9-11 and wanting to, it, Afghanistan was too easy and somehow in the, in the political psyche there was, they, they, they sensed a need to go after someone else, to beat up somebody else for 9-11 for and it just coincided <coughs> with all, all the other agendas for, for having a big presence in the Middle East. No, I don't think it was so angry about 9-11. I think they wanted to go in, you know, even before 9-11, you know, we've got evidence from the Bob Woodward books <coughs> that Iraq was in their sights from, you know, January the 20th, January the 20th 2001, the day of the inauguration um, <coughs> at Bush Jr. So I think um, then they got diverted, as it were, by 9-11 and Afghanistan became the first target because um, uh, that's where, you know, Osama was based. <coughs> But uh, I think Iraq was always in their sights, and Iran was also in their sights. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, there were these stories about Ira the Israelis sort of counseling against the invasion <coughs> uh, of Iraq, uh, Sharon allegedly telling Bush that it was a bad move and so on. Um, <coughs> presumably because Sharon thought Iran should be dealt with and not Iraq, and they got the wrong. And then when he was assured, so it said, that once they've dealt with Iraq, then they'll move on to Iran. Sharon sort of uh, calmed down a bit. Um, but I think that was always the intention. And, um, you know, because the, the weapons of mass destruction, uh, they thought, you know, I think, they did think that they were there. Mm -hmm. I don't think they... That they, or if they weren't there, that he had a program, just like they now claim that Iran definitely has a program for nuclear weapons, and, and so you better eliminate him as soon as you can. <coughs> Who's next? Um, I'll go to the back of the room now. The lady in the corner, and then I'll work forward. I hope to get to everybody before the, the evening's over. Hello, Sue Davis, um, freelance journalist. I was in uh, Basra 
few times. And I suppose uh, you mentioned that the British Army was, in response to the question, that the British Army is pretty pragmatic on the ground. Uh, but I, when I was there, um, Army officers, senior officers, were saying that uh, they had been much more prepared, that they had been prepared in a way that you are now saying the British political and diplomatic class was not. Did you, do you get any sense um, that before the invasion, when they were working up to it, that there was greater preparation on the, side, on the part of the, uh, the British Army? Um, in particular, say, for example, um, did they know more about Sistani? Did they know more about uh, Muqtada al-Sada, the Shia, etc.? And would you have said that the British, that the British Army was um, as prepared, not as prepared or more prepared than the American Army might have been? So I'm trying to peel away the military from... Yeah, the no, no, I, 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 I can see what you're saying. Um, well, I mean, I interviewed about three of the top people in the in the in the British Army on the, these issues but my sense was that they were this the policy was the one I mentioned earlier containment um, let's not forget that the British were never meant to be sort of running Basra politically the the, 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 the original plan was that the CPA would would run Basra and they put a Dane in charge of it. The first, the, the sort of Paul Bremer's representative in Basra was a Dane at the beginning. Um, it wasn't a Brit at all. So that the idea we, people often have in their minds that because Britain had a long history in Basra from 1918, 1920 and so on, uh, during the first occupation that therefore the Americans sort of gave Britain the South to run politically. Um, is not true. Uh, the, the idea was the CPA would run it, headquarters would be in Baghdad, and the representative, as I say, was going to be somebody from Denmark. Um, this man then angered Bremer about three months after he got there, in about July, and by making some public comment in a newspaper interview, complaining that Baghdad wasn't sending enough money down there. And so Bremer basically had him sacked. And Hillary Sinnott, former ambassador, British ambassador in Pakistan, was suddenly rung up and asked um, to go down and, 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 and be in Basra. Uh, and so sort of by default almost, the, the British sort of suddenly were, a Brit was in charge of the politics of the CPA in the south. Um, and the military was really confined to these almost non-political things, uh, uh, containment, stability, and reconstruction, and obviously the sort of patrolling, security patrolling that they were doing. They didn't really have very many political ambitions, and, and the ones that they had seemed to be confined to the sort of points I made earlier, that a sort of, we'd better appoint a governor, find somebody who's not linked to the previous regime, then when they were told that he wasn't the right person, they had sort of problems, then point somebody else. And so it was sort of pragmatic, but within, with a dialogue with what they thought was the sort of Iraqi elite that they could locate in, in Basra. So, so I think it was sort of very, very much politics on the hoof. I don't think they had any long-term vision. Um, uh, they were just sort of trying to find the, the counterparts in the political sphere to whom the CPA could relate and who would help them in terms of maintaining security and stability. We'll take the gentleman in the blue jumper next to you. I will get to you. I will get to you. <laughs> um, hi, there, there seems to be a, um, a very sort of uh, careful use of, use, of, use of the vocabulary both here and in America. We're talking about the, uh, the resistance faced by the, uh, the, uh, the armies in, uh, in Iraq. Referring to the, the enemy as Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups, um, to what extent do you think um, this this phrase Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups is misleading, and that perhaps it isn't Al Qaeda uh, more than a, a fraction, um, and it's a, sort of more another group, and, and it's a very handy way of, of creating a um, creating a, a sort of 
channel to to um, to uh, um, to to, uh, to to basic to basically uh, uh, explode a um, a myth of of, of Al Qaeda when <coughs> uh, sort of, uh, yeah different resistant groups altogether. Well, it's very hard to know, obviously, what the strength of any of these insurgent groups is. I mean, both in terms of the number of people they have on the ground and um, how well armed they are and so on. I mean, it's by definition, that is the sort of thing that is almost unquantifiable. I mean, intelligence agencies probably have their estimates and the U.S. Army probably has estimates, but they, they don't really give them out. Um, so we're all, it's very hard to know how many how, how to count these people, but it seems you know f the impression one has is that Al Qaeda, the leadership is foreign, largely Saudi, um, but a lot of the sort of foot soldiers are Iraqi, and some of them are paid, and some of them are ideologically convinced, they're hardline Salafis you know who think that Shia infidel and and they have to be driven out, especially now that they're sort of running the country, they have to be toppled and removed and so on. Um, but I think um, it, probably a lot of it is money. You know, if you're an unemployed young guy in a Sunni city in western Iraq somewhere, um, somebody comes along and offers to pay you money um, to plant a bomb or to an IED or something, you know, some people will go along with that. Um, so it does seem that most of the, the foot soldiers of Al-Qaeda are Iraqi, whatever their exact motivation may be. But the, the crucial point is that, which I think is, you know, your, uh, the thrust of your question, as I understand it, is to imply that Al-Qaeda is exaggerated and that really it's Iraqis who are doing the resisting. Um, and I think, you know, I would agree with that. And, and particularly going back to the history, and, and the history of this is so important, the first few months, there was no Al Qaeda. You know, Al Qaeda took some time to come in there. Um, they started with some very spectacular bombings of the Jordanian embassy, and then the killing of the UN man Sergio Vieira de Mello, um, and then there was a terrible um, the bombing of uh, the Ayatollah Hakim. Um, so they started with some real <coughs> sort of spectaculars. <coughs> they weren't designed against civilians en masse, but against key civilian targets that had symbolic value, foreign embassy, UN, senior Shia, Ayatollah. Um, but the sort of Al-Qaeda, uh, part of the resistance in the sense of attacking the Americans, took quite a long time to develop. And as I was saying, you know, when we talked about Fallujah, the, it, it was really locally, uh, locally based. Uh, um, and, they were, and these were just ordinary people angered by what was happening in their own town or city. And there was this one thing which I, I mentioned in the book and was in one of the excerpts that uh, I think it was in one of the excerpts that The Guardian carried about this briefing that we attended. I mean, this was already a year after the occupation. It was sort of around June 2004. So Al-Qaeda had come in, but it was still this relatively minor player on the scene. Um, and we were being given a briefing on uh, what was going on and who the enemy was and difficulties the British Army and the coalition were facing, et cetera, et cetera. And this young officer who was giving the briefing, a sort of PowerPoint thing, kept going on saying, you know, when we get news of the AIF doing something, we have to respond, of course. And he was going on and on about this AIF thing. And we were thought, what the hell does that stand for? So somebody said, well, what does AIF mean? What's that acronym? We've never heard it before. He said it stands for anti-Iraqi forces. <laughs> so we should have looked at each other, and somebody said, well, "I mean, why don't you call them anti-government forces? You know, or anti-occupation forces? I mean, they're Iraqi, aren't they?" <laughs> and General McCall, who um, I see is now mentioned in the today's papers as a possible uh, overlord in Afghanistan, instead of poor old Paddy Ashdown, who wasn't acceptable. Um, but uh, General John McCall, who was the top officer and the second in command of the uh, Mountain National Force at that stage, sort of stepped in to try to um, cover over the embarrassment that this young officer was showing. 
Uh, and he said, no, we don't, no, no, this is standard coalition usage. It's, it, we're not, it's not just today, this is the normal usage. <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> is this better or worse? <laughs> this gentleman here in the uh, uh, beige jacket, uh, I've been asked uh, whether questioners might stand up to ask the question, please. Um, <coughs> I'm Brian Barter, I was one of the 52 ex-diplomats or five diplomats who signed the letter, but I'm not an Arabist and I don't have contacts, or very few contacts, with the people who were in the office at the time uh, of the invasion. Um, I'm obviously depressed at your account of what uh, that generation of foreign office diplomats failed to do in the run-up to the invasion, uh, if indeed your, uh, your informants are, are accurate. But I wanted to ask about um, warnings about illegality. Um, we know that the Deputy Foreign Office legal advisor resigned over this and in fact described uh, the, use of <coughs> the use of force uh, as um, amounting to the crime of aggression in writing in a minute that was copied to Jack Straw. Um, and I think the impression was given that the rest of the Foreign Office legal advisors were probably broadly in agreement with her. Jack Straw must have known uh, that this was the view of his own legal advisors. I wonder if you had any impression of how far Straw passed that on either to Tony Blair or to the rest of the cabinet, and whether he really expressed any serious reservations about the legality of the whole operation. Well, I think in John Campner's book, uh, Blair's War, I think, he, doesn't he um, report a letter that Straw wrote to Blair about two days before the invasion, raising some doubts, even after the Attorney General had come up with his second opinion saying that the war was legal. So now, you know, whether that is Straw trying to sort of polish his image a bit, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I really have no particular information on that. I was, because of that whole issue of illegality had been gone into so heavily, because the weapons of mass destruction and the Hutton inquiry and David Kelly had been gone into so much already, I thought, you know, coming to the decision to write a book on Iraq, I thought I must try and break some new ground and I want to concentrate on the, the political advice that was given of what sort of Iraq would you face once you've got rid of Saddam and that seemed to me I mean I you know I, I say in the book maybe exaggerating but I, I think that was as much of a blunder as the getting the weapons of mass destruction wrong was the getting the the, the landscape of post Saddam Iraq wrong was equally much of a blunder and, and the lack of analysis uh, and the lack of political intelligence was as serious as the lack of military intelligence about what the state of Saddam's arsenal really was. We have a couple of questions over here in the corner. Yes, uh, I'd like your opinion on the, those on the right who don't accept the concept of defeat and point to the increase in violence following the surge as an example. Um, and also the arming of Sunni self-defense groups to bring them on side in the awakening. Your, your right. Well, first of all, I mean, defeat is obviously a provocative title, and I'm particularly talking about a political defeat uh, for the Bush people. Um, I'm not trying to claim that the Americans have been sort of driven off the battlefield in, in, a, in a military sense. Um, I'm primarily talking about a political defeat that the neocon goal of this liberal, secular, pro-Western, stable Iraq uh, as a bastion uh, in the Middle East has been defeated. It will never happen uh, as long as the occupation continues. And one day, maybe, Iraq will move in that direction. So it's a political defeat I'm talking about. Um, I mean, you, you know, you can get into semantics about asymmetrical warfare. If a highly armed, high-tech army cannot defeat guerrillas after five years and has taken already 4,000 casualties dead, plus any number of people maimed them for life, uh, you know, isn't that in a way a defeat? If, if you don't have victory after five years, then it, it is a kind of defeat. You're just facing an endless war of attrition. Um, but uh, as I say, my, my argument 
although there is a picture of a soldier on the front cover, the argument is basically it's political defeat. Um, but you know, you're right to raise the issue of the surge, because particularly in America, it seems it's having quite a big effect, and there are people who now think it's it's victory. <laughs> you know, they, if they like John McCain, you could write a book saying victory, or he, and uh, it seems to be the thing that saved his campaign. Uh, you know, that he's now able to say, you know, I predicted this, everybody else was lily livered and was talking about withdrawal and timetables and cutting back, and, uh, and I was the one who could see that there was a chance of victory. Well, I mean, the, there are a number of reasons why the casualties have gone down um, and the attacks on the Americans have gone down <coughs> that are independent of the surge. One of them is the thing you've just alluded to, the awakening movement in the, in the Sunni areas. Because the, the, there has been tension between Al-Qaeda, which, as I say, was perceived as foreign and as having its own agenda, just as much as the Americans are, tension between those people and the Iraqi nationalists who just want to run their country on their own and develop it and keep it as it was, a sort of country that's a mixed Sunni, Shia, Kurdish country. Um, and, um, and initially they went along with Al-Qaeda because their main enemy seemed to be the Americans. So if the Al-Qaeda are attacking the Americans, then and we're the resistance. We're also attacking the Americans. We're on a sort of parallel track. We agree with them. But then as they saw the way Al-Qaeda was really just seemed to be interested in total destabilization, sectarian warfare, just sort of bring the whole thing down on everybody. Tensions developed and people got more and more alienated from the Al-Qaeda philosophy. Now, did they start putting that alienation into practice? It's taken them a long time to do it. And it's quite risky because a lot of people who've stood up against Al-Qaeda in the Sunni community have been assassinated. Um, and so it's, it's a very tough struggle, but the mood does seem to have changed in the latter part of 2006. You know, the, the worst sectarian killings began after the bombing of the Samara Mosque, the Golden Dome, in February 2006. And so by the end of 2006, the, the, the animosity among Sunnis to Al-Qaeda had grown to quite a high level. and. Um, the Americans, I think, the, re the real sort of message that comes from the surge is the uh, General Petraeus has had the sense to realize that politics in Iraq are local uh, and that, that you, you can't only operate with a national army because it's not national, it's largely Shia and Kurdish anyway. So you've got to go down to the local level. And if you, if you can build up Sunni militias to go against Al-Qaeda and to be on the American side, you know, you're, you're more likely to defeat Al-Qaeda. And so the focus of these Sunni militias, uh, uh, the tribal sheikhs and the imams and so on who were supporting the resistance, uh, sh shifted. And they, they now started to say, no, the main enemy at the moment in the short term is Al-Qaeda, not the Americans. So we'll leave the Americans on the side. You know, no more attacks on the Americans. In fact, we're willing to take money and arms from the Americans. But it's, it's a very fragile policy because, of course, if Al-Qaeda were to be defeated and if the Americans continue to remain in Iraq and don't get out, then the Sunni insurgency could switch back and start attacking the Americans because Al-Qaeda was one set of foreigners out. Now we get the, back to the ones who were the first ones who got here, the Americans. And, and so it's a quite a, you know, the, the, it's, it's very hard to predict exactly what will happen, but it's quite a two-edged sword, this business of the Americans arming and training and paying these, uh, these uh, Sunni uh, Arab insurgents. So, so that's the first thing anyway. The, 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 the anti-Al-Qaeda thing and the, the move towards um, not attacking the Americans happened before the surge, before the extra troops went in. Secondly, there, there are very few Shia attacks on the Americans now because Moqtad al-Sadr has called a ceasefire five months ago. He called a six-month ceasefire. So, you know, in a month's time, he'll have to decide whether to prolong it or not. Uh, now, you can argue that to some extent his ceasefire is a cover for the fact he, he didn't want to resist the Americans because they were, you know, turning their attention towards him. And, uh, you know, maybe he couldn't, they, he, he, he didn't feel his militia could, you know, confront them on open ground. They had to sort of go underground and recoup and retrain. And, and so he called a ceasefire as a sort of cover 
for, for a temporary withdrawal. Um, but whatever his motives were, the fact is that the ceasefire is largely held, so there the are very few Shia attacks on the Americans. So that's another reason. And then when it comes to the reason why of killings of, of the um, uh, you know, civilians gone down, is it thanks to the Amer increased American presence, or is there another reason? It, another potential reason um, is that, putting it really bluntly, that um, it, it's not so easy to find victims. Uh, the mixed neighborhoods of Baghdad have now collapsed. If you were a minority Shia group in a largely Sunni area, you've now fled to an area where the Shia in the majority, vice versa, the Sunnis, if they were the minority in a mixed area area have now fled to ones where the Sunnis are in a majority. So the whole area has become sort of sect it's been cleansed in a sectarian way, partly by intimidation, partly by people voluntarily fleeing. And there's this massive displacement, as you know, going on. A lot of people have left the country as well. And so, you know, if you're out to kill a civilian from the, the opposite sect, if you're a Sunni and you want to kill a Shia, uh, it's harder to find them, frankly. Um, and, uh, and these walls that have been put up around the Baghdad neighborhoods to sort of s solidify this, these new mono-ethnic or mono-sectarian areas have also had an effect. And, and probably the American patrolling has had an effect too. Plus the fact that in these areas, there are also vigilante neighborhood watch type groups have been set up as well, which are armed. So there are a number of factors. So, so it's very simplistic to say the, the extra 30,000 troops have suddenly turned the tide, and this is why victory is now around the corner. McCain is here to get. Yeah, McCain. Of course, he'll use it to argue for a yeah, uh, yeah, longer term. Yeah, no, no, and it'd be very interesting to see once the Democratic um, race is, you know, is over and we have a single candidate, whether that person, the Democrat, <coughs> is willing to continue with the argument that we have to have a withdrawal and a date for, for getting out or whether they will feel nervous uh, because, you know, after all, Kerry was defeated on the grounds that he was, you know, a lily-livered uh, liberal who was uh, letting our troops down and, uh, and defeatist and all the rest of it, and Bush got in. So, so it can be quite difficult to see, uh, you know, for, for the Democratic candidate to find the right balance between making the point the war was wrong in the first place if it's Obama, and uh, there has to be some clarity about withdrawal, and yet not appear to be uh, admitting defeat. Well, it's almost 9 o'clock. I'm going to have to uh, thank you, John. Perhaps you would uh, stay and answer questions to, for those who didn't get a chance to uh, ask them publicly for a few minutes afterwards. Thank you very much for excellent questions this evening. And thank you very much for a most engaging and compelling book. I thought I was going to read it. and. Uh, still disagree with John, and I have to confess that his argument was uh, uh, tight enough and, and strong enough to have made a convert of me. So I recommend it to you highly. And, uh, and by the way, the book is sold at an incredible discount. It's hopeless for my royalties. I wish you wouldn't buy it, but would buy it in a shop. And if you do buy it here, you get 50% off. <laughs> Thank you very much.